honor and pleasure, I introduce our esteemed speaker for today, Hari Krishnan, who is going to talk on emerging technologies in data and AI for today's session. He's the senior director at Brillio and in the past has worked with Cognizant and Accenture. Hari is a seasoned technology senior executive who has dedicated a significant portion of his career to advanced technology architecture and enterprise architecture services. With a wealth of experience, he has led special initiative and projects, as well as teams focused on data science, AI, and ML. Hari is a certified coach for design thinking, cloud, AWS, scaled agile, distributed agile, and DevOps. He's a proven leader, having handled PNL ownership, E2E contract delivery, critical IT transformations globally, operation setups, business development, technology-based sales, solution architecture, and product architecture. With a unique blend of consulting, delivery, data, and technology architecture skills, Hari has global experience. He has successfully managed large integrated programs at renowned organizations such as Deutsche Bank, NIIT Technologies, and HCL Technologies at various locations, such as Frankfurt, Singapore, and UK. His achievements include designing and delivering data lakes and analytical performance, uh, analytical platforms over hybrid cloud capable of supporting massive data volumes. He is a subject matter expert on big data, distributed, and decentralized systems. His contribution, he has contributed significantly to development of reference models, architectures, patterns, and migration models in the realm of big data and cloud computing across hybrid environments. His extensive work experience encompasses a wide range of sectors, including capital market, investment banking, telecommunication, media and entertainment, electronics and high tech, and travel and transport. This diverse background allows him to offer a unique and well-rounded perspective, which we shall all witness today, to widen our purviews. With this, I request Hari sir to address the PGDM GM badge of XLRI. So please. Thank you. Can you all hear me? See me? Yes, sir. Okay. It's slightly chilled in Bangalore. So I'm wearing a sweater, okay? And today is actually a day that we spend normally all day in office because we started believing in coming into office, right? Just like all of you coming into XLRI every day, right? <clears throat> so call me as Hari. And I think, um, thank you for that introduction. It was very heavy data introduction, right? Um, I know this batch has got a lot of expectations, a lot of questions, uh, but let us take a look at in terms of what is happening in the industry, okay? So I'll share my screen um, if you're able to see. Yeah, so we are able to see it now. Okay. So you're all good. So... Our topic today is basically data and AI and the industry trends, right? So I don't want to really um, run through the deck, but rather I would like uh, to take you through some uh, real life examples in terms of how um, the data and AI uh, projects are happening in the industry. So it'll be it'll be a completely living experience for you. And at any, any point of time, if you think that, you know, um, you need more clarifications, uh, you can actually um, uh, pass it over. We can take it up at the end of the session if uh, time permits, right? There is some time that has been given for uh, Q&A and some of these areas where we can uh, discuss. But predominantly, these areas are uh, industry-specific and industry and the domain uh, flavor, and I've made it in such a way that you know you will be able to understand all of them uh, in a very simple uh, way, right? So, having said that, let me just take you through what are the topics that we are going to discuss, right? So, what's happening in this whole data industry, right? 
Um, and this whole activities about big data uh, that has started maybe around 15 years back, right? And all that while everybody was actually talking about normal databases, right? And all of a sudden, uh, there were concerns in terms of data growing. And as data is growing, your physical infrastructure growing, right? And then your applications need to handle the growth of that particular data. So if you remember uh, the whole, the three Vs of data, right? That is what is there, where it's all started. It's volume, variety, and veracity. These three things, right? So data comes in different forms, right? So normally in a typical data world, before I go into the data modernization, and then there is a data warehouse modernization, and then there is a modernization roadmap. I am going to show you in a tip, in a real environment how this modernization happens, and some of those examples are taken uh, from their real life with our clients. And definitely, the another very important part is that cloud is coming into this picture, right? So data plus cloud. So how is it working, right? So whether it is data, big data systems in AWS, big data systems in Google Cloud Platform, or Azure. Right? Or is it um, data processing using Databricks or Snowflake? We'll touch upon some of those areas without going deep into those technology areas so that you can understand them and relate them better to what you're hearing, what you're actually doing. Um, and you know, some of those um, uh, very, very specific uh, examples that is happening in front of our I say uh, uh, Netflix, right? Take an example, right? So everybody is on Netflix nowadays, right? Uh, people spend a lot of time. But do we really understand how is Netflix running and what is behind that speed and what is behind that real-time streaming, right? And which technology is powering Netflix? Another example is all we all watched IPL this time, right? And if you have watched IPL this time, you all saw that you know, in Geo, IPL was streaming in a very uh, nice way initially. Right, and the initial one or two weeks, there was a lag, okay? And then all of a sudden, what happened? It has become a fast streaming, and then it's Geo is improved, and which platform they were actually using, right? These kind of things, and banging frameworks, right? Even though we are saying that in the end of the day, uh, 60 to 70 percentage of bank processing is still happening in the legacy platforms in mainframes, right? And there is a reluctancy in terms of moving from the legacy to the modern data platforms. Still, there are banks adopting this, and then there are use cases like uh, fraud detection, anomaly detection, right? Customer retention, all these kind of stuff where AIML is being very heavily used. So cloud is very, very important. So we'll spend some time on data on cloud evaluation. How do we select, hey, this is a cloud platform I have to uh, use for my uh, set of use cases, okay? So I will not go with the comparison, but I'll give you some examples in terms of, in a typical uh, uh, consulting way, how do we normally go and select the cloud on what basis, right? Then the much awaited topic about data fabric and data mesh. What is this data fabric? What is this data mesh, right? So I'll give you an examples between these two. And then we'll spend some time on data science and AI, right? Um, as you call me as a data guy, right? My slides are very heavy, okay? And I would like to tell you that this is a very rich crowd, experienced crowd, and you guys are great learners, fast learners, and I have 91 slides here, okay? Um, so how do we consume this 91 slides? It is just as equivalent to how do we migrate a large data platform into cloud, right? How do, how do we make it fast? So what I'm giving you hint is that some places I'll accelerate, some places I will slow down, right? So, um, so there is an innate way normally we can understand you know, how uh, uh, people understand, right? So these are, who are we, right? First of all, I represent Glio, uh, and thank you for that introduction. So basically modernization, platform modernization is something that we are, uh, discussing. If you remember application development, application engineering, developing an application in Java, 
developing an application in uh, using Python or in C++, all these were happening and this is still happening, right? But it is called legacy, right? Now, initially it was migrating data into uh, uh, an on-premise data platform. Say for example, an Oracle database, which is running an ERP system, right? Enterprise resource planning system, which is running on Oracle database, which is on-premise, and you're migrating that into a cloud ecosystem. That is called data migration. Gone are those, those days, okay? So we are not even talking about data migration. We are talking about modernizing the data while we are migrating the data. So what do you mean by modernization? You must have heard about application modernization, right? So we'll come into that. Elevating the customer experience. End of the day, whatever you do with the data on backend, right? Whether you are doing data processing, whether you're doing data management, whether you're doing data cataloging, whether you're doing uh, BI or ML consumption, you're doing all these kind of stuff. Unless you make it as a very great experience for the customer, right? There is no use. End of the day, the customer is a person who is going to put a tick mark in terms of, did you uh, do it right, right? So that, that stuff. Empowering the business functions, right? Every organization is having siloed business functions, lot of line of business, right? Now, the question is that if you heard about this particular term called data democratization, right? See, my way of telling you is that some of these jargons, some of these terms, the best way to understand them is to relate them to the real life, right? So data democratization, right? I'll tell you an easy way to understand Right? How do you democratize the data? What is what do you mean by democracy? Democracy is a place, India is a democratic country, right? So democracy means everybody has got rights. Everybody has got equal rights, right? That is what is democracy mean. So data democratization means you have a data ecosystem, but you have your stakeholders, whether your internal stakeholders, your external stakeholders, your business, who can access which piece of data? right? That is democratizing the data, making it available for everybody, right? And that is what is democratization is. We will spend some time on this business functions um, um, part. Then comes to the automating this data and AI operations, right? So when you look at this, these four are very, very critical in today's industry. And that is where we are, right? So a differentiated approach to problem solving and exploring expertise in end-to-end -end analytics value chain, credible recognition and partnership ecosystem, highly engaged, competent global talent. These four are very, very critical. So what I'm saying is that, what is the approach to drive, right? So, so today's business problems requires, you know, um, a how to approach to break down silos, maximize outcomes and value from data assets, right? A lot of people talk about data assets, a lot of people talk about data products. Some people talk about data products and some people talk about data as a service, data as a product, okay? So it's very important to understand the difference between all of them, right? So the growth of the data and the experience and the efficiency and the trust and adoption, right? So introducing it basically context dimensions and mechanisms. Um, so I will just take it to an example in terms of normally how do we do it, right? So we see it from a persona point of view, right? A deep appreciation of the customer need is very, very important, okay? Even though you are working on a data ecosystem, who are your consumers? End of the day, if you are actually building a BI engine, business intelligence engine, where you have a bunch of reports, right? Now, some of them are uh, self-serve reports, some of them are canned reports, some of them are MIS reports, right? Who are the people who are actually consuming this data? So persona, problem, performance, purpose, and potential is very important. Then you should see this from a, a dimensions perspective, from a data lens perspective, right? So insight lens, model, adoption, and consumption lens, and human lens. So you should be able to see it from this multiple lens uh, approach. Then data products, accelerators, engineering at the scale, Math squared and agile delivery, right? These are very, very critical from a mechanism. So a context to dimensions to mechanism 
how do we deliver this to our customers? So let us go through some of these examples in terms of modernization. When you say modernization, right? Previously, application modernization, that is easiest way. Why I'm taking in that route is because it is always easy to go from a known to unknown, right? So a known area is basically modernizing an application. There are a lot of uh, previous, um, uh, uh, maybe five years back, right? What was really happening is that a lot of act activities happening uh, behind the scenes in the mainframes for banging systems, right? But there is no web UI or UI that was not created basically accessing this particular banking systems. And people cannot always go to the mainframe, right? Because end users cannot log into the mainframe systems. So how do you make sure that these processing systems are accessible to the end users? So what people used to do is that modernizing that application by building a web UI and exposing that web UI to the users so that users can access through the web UI and it was maybe connected to a, a, a backend mainframe system, right? This is application modernization. So you have modernized that application for a better consumption for a better use case. So what is data modernization? So when you get the data from a source system, when we speak about data, right? There is always different types of data that will come. Remember, I told you about data volume, variety, and veracity, okay? Everybody knows volume. And we spoke about big data, okay? It is in setabytes or petabytes, right? So it goes, it grows. It, it never comes down, okay? It is like, you know, your, your, uh, your home shopping list, right? And we buy a buy lot of stuff, right? But we never purge. If you, if you come to a typical Indian household, you can really see that there are a lot of items that we have bought is still piled up in different, different places. So we have an emotional attachment to all these systems and we never uh, think about, you know, uh, disposing them, right? So similar way, data is getting accumulated. So whether it is structured data, unstructured data, and semi-structured data. So structured data means it is normally the data that comes from RDBMS and then there are columns and rows and all kinds of stuff, right? Unstructured data means it is basically come through IoT devices, sensors and all kinds of stuff. For example, weather data, right? Um, so we normally use different uh, terms like you know, JSON files or whether they're coming as uh, uh, CSV files or uh, from the source, how it is coming, right? So from a data modernization perspective, how do we approach? First thing is that a business case. I'm sure this crowd is very familiar in terms of a business case, right? Until unless you have an approved business case, right? Nothing can happen. How do, how, what is the essence of a business case? In a business case, you should have a problem statement. Okay, why are you doing this? The second thing is that how are you solving it? And the third thing is that what is that you are going to achieve when you solve it? So that means the value realization has to be very clearly. So it is your return of investment, right? Or is it uh, uh, your, uh, you know, kind of, you know, speed, your performance, okay? Through which people are meeting it. It is basically your availability, right? So what is, what is the, what are the benefits, right? So the second is modernization analysis. Then current state discovery. What is your current state, right? Um, means, how many databases are there? What are the different databases? How big is your data? Okay. What is your history data volume? What is your uh, incremental data volume? Right. All those kind of stuff. And then it is called a data discovery we perform. And then we build an architecture and POC. This POC is a very uh, old acronym, proof of concept, right? But nowadays it has been called as MVPs, right? Nobody wants a POC. A proof of concept is always made to mitigate a risk, whether it is a business risk or whether it is a technological risk, right? And then we'll build a data modernization roadmap. So what I'm going to show you is that some of the things in a data modernization roadmap, how this is getting, right? And then once we have done this kind of stuff, then we get into a bigger plane where we do Think about, you know, setting up of a platform, right? Now, then we are discussing about, you know, multiple things. We set up an execution office. We set up a, a continuous delivery CI, CD. Uh, then 
industrialization, data management, governance. So very, very important point on data quality and data governance, right? So if, you, if time permits, we'll touch upon that, right? Uh, data operating model and change management. Change management is a very, very important thing. And change management applies to every part of our life is also there, right? Not only for applications or not only for data, right? But nowadays, you, you know, COVID has really, uh, uh, COVID has made a big change into the way people are living, right? And it is the, I always call it as a human change management. And the most complex change management is a human change management, right? Um, and on-premise cutoff, you need to cut off your on-premise systems and then move over to the new enterprise systems, right? So now look at the business case. Again, I'm not going to uh, narrate each of them, but I'm going to give you a perspective about you know, some of these things, right? Determine the current cost components, transition cost, finalize the value realization plan. All this is a part of business case. I'm sure all of you are aware of how to build a business case, okay? I think the most important thing before even you go and start a talk, okay, with your customer or with a business or for any case is a business case. Do we have a compelling business case that is there, right? Modernization analysis is means understand the drivers. Why do you need to modernize, right? And then establish guiding principles and approach lift and shift or whether it is, you know, uh, transform, what do you mean by lift and shift? Normally it is uh, just lifting and putting it here, right? Current state discovery. What is the complexity of your current data estate, right? How many components are there? Uh, what is the volume? What is the variety? What is the veracity available there, right? So now, once you have done that, then you move into an architecture and POC. You need to create a target state architecture. I'm going to show you some of those uh, uh, architecture slides, even though it, it you all of you may not be able to understand that, you will get a perspective around it, right? And evaluate data usage patterns. Very, very important, guys, here. And this is what the most important. Okay, you build a data lake, you build a lake house, you build a data warehouse, okay? You build entire platform, but who's going to use it, right? You have to define the usage patterns. That is very, very important. Modernization roadmap, right? Execution work streams, you need to identify stakeholder workshops and buying. And why design thinking is important here. Okay, because design thinking is a way you can actually involve various stakeholders to solve the problem. Okay, and it is not one person solving the problem, it is you're solving the problem together. Especially in a data world, in kind of a data, it's slightly different from an application development and an application uh, area. Why? Because data is very close to any customer. Data is very close to any business, right? And nobody will give you an access to the data. No business will give you an access to the data just like that. So it is very, very important. You co-create the value uh, with the customers, with the business, right? And you need to take them along with you. That is why I'm telling you the relevance of design thinking, okay, in doing a data workshop is very, very critical, very, very important, right? Because design thinking allows everybody to be part of that particular problem and everybody to be thinking about the solutions, clustering techniques, uh, problem solving, prototyping, testing, right? A lot of stuff, right? Uh, execution roadmap, develop time and cost estimates, right? So this, these are some of the things in the modernization uh, strategy. Uh, again, I'm not going to go in deep to this, but we have a very, very detailed process model in terms of how do we really take it through uh, a data modernization uh, journey. Execution office, platform standup, and each of them have their own, uh, you know, their own artifacts, templates, right? It's all templatized, right? Uh, delivery use using DevOps and data ops, data platform migration, right? You look at execution office, setting it up of continuous delivery platform standup, right? Each of these, activities that you see here. Each of these activity you see here, they have their own templates. There are their own delivery engine in terms of how do you do it, right? 
So we looked at some of these things, data management and governance, right? And on-premise cutoff, right? Now, this is about data modernization. That is one trend that is happening. So I'm telling you, in industry, it is no more data migration. It is data modernization. And data migration is part of the data modernization. Now look at, there is another big area called data warehouse modernization. Again, I'm telling you, my whole message to all of you is that even though if some of you don't know what is a warehouse, right? Data warehouse, DWH, normally we'll say. If you, if you talk to any data guy, they will say that, hey, DWH, SQL DWH, right? Oracle EDW, right? Uh, Azure Synapse, okay? Uh, Google GBQ, okay? These are things, right? These are all warehouses, right? AWS Redshift, right? Uh, Snowflake is a virtual warehouse, right? So people started using the term called VDH. Now it was DWH, VDH, right? But I am telling you, relate to real life. What is a warehouse? Everybody knows that what is a warehouse, right? People, distribution systems uh, use warehouses across US. See, for example, if you take uh, if you take a company called Lineage, they have warehouses everywhere in US. Everywhere you go, airport or port, you go, you can actually see a big warehouse there. You store things. Do we store today's, do we need a warehouse to store today's item? No. A warehouse is a place where we store items, okay, for months and for years sometimes, right? And that is why data warehouse, right? Data warehouses always store history data, okay? Not for transaction data. Transactional data, there are two types of data, right? Normally, transactional data and analytical data. Transactional data normally comes from day-to-day -day business, right? And which has been consumed by different applications for functioning. Analytical data is basically the historical data, right? Which has been stored basically for future purpose. And that is where you need a warehouse. Warehouse modernization is another industry trend, right? Let me just quickly check time check. Yeah. So expand to more improve responsiveness, balance, business critical and ex exploration. One critical area, one important business case for warehouse is basically responsiveness, performance, accessing. A Power BI report, uh, a BI report, right? It needs a level of aggregation to access the data from an Azure Synapse database, right? So how do you build uh, rollups and cubes, right? to make this access is very important, right? And what is required in a, what is a, what is a drive for a warehouse modernization? A data flexibility, right? Cost effective scalability, go beyond the SQL decoupled architecture. Now, this point is very important, right? You look at SQL. SQL has been there for many, many years, right? And there is an affinity towards SQL, right? If you really look at, uh, what has really happened to Microsoft, right? I, I know you all of you like case studies, right? And especially industry case studies, right? Is part of your uh, part and parcel of the studies, right? Um, why do we need a why do we need a uh, SQL? Microsoft has actually made a lot of money using their MS SQL database. This was one of my favorite, and it was one of the favorite of Microsoft. And they were not ready to move away from SQL DWH, right? Whereas Amazon, AWS of the world, Google's of the world, they built, AWS built Redshift, uh, Google built GBQ, Snowflake built uh, their virtual warehouse, right? All of them built their databases and they started advancing. Whereas Microsoft stood on SQL DWH. And this is one of the major uh, area of area uh, where Microsoft is still solving that problem because they realized later that a transformation of SQL DWH is required into Azure Synapse. Okay, and they missed that point and then missed the best, right? By the time the market has been captured by other people and things are moving very fast. So if your decision-making is very slow, in especially in these areas and, and if you're a product company and the, what is it you say in a typical 
time to market, right? A time to market uh, system is not functioning in a product development engagement and you're taking more time due to multiple factors, right? Then it will take, it will hit you on business, right? Now, what happened is that they were not able to do spark processing in Azure ecosystem. And then they got Databricks in Azure ecosystem and the Databricks took over their entire spark processing. Now they're trying to regain the kingdom back into Azure Synapse into the Spark pool in Azure Synapse. But it is not easy One, once a country is being conquered and it is being captured, right? Taking it back requires a lot of effort, right? Decoupled architecture. Always we speak about uh, compute and storage, right? Compute and storage are two words that has been used. Decoupled compute and storage, and that is the benefit of Snowflake. Snowflake architecture, the virtual architecture, allows you to change the compute and storage in a different way. Actually, the VDH in Snowflake is being called as a virtual warehouse, but it is not a virtual warehouse. It is actually a compute engine. Okay, so we'll touch upon some of these things, right? And why is warehouse modernization required, right? So traditional EDW tightly coupled, uh, so storage and compute is tightly coupled. Data ingestion is structured and batch based. Data management is controlled and siloed. Data consumption is static and limited to standard reporting. But whereas in the new age data warehouse is loosely coupled, data flexibility, right? Think about a stacked warehouse, tightly stacked normal warehouse where uh, products are stacked one after another, right? If you want to retrieve one, it's so difficult because you have to hold the other things from being, you know, collapsing, right? And then you need to pull it out, right? So loosely coupled is very, very important. Multiple formats and velocities. Uh, so go beyond SQL, right? So SQL is one thing very, very important. Normally, a lot of flavors of SQL. For example, Snowflake uses Snow SQL, whereas uh, the normal Microsoft SQL engine uses ANSI SQL, right? So it is important to understand these various, and Oracle says that it's PL SQL, right? So there are data type differences, uh, functions are different, right? So when you are migrating from one to another, you need to understand. But there is something that is called as NoSQL also, right? So to store unstructured data, you need a NoSQL database. Hadoop ecosystems had uh, H-based, high kind of databases, right? And if you take Microsoft Azure system, Cosmos DB uh, in Azure ecosystem is a NoSQL database, right? Uh, if you take the case of, uh, uh, if you take the case of uh, Google BigQuery, right? Uh, so BigQuery is a data warehouse, GBQ is a, uh, uh, so they have a NoSQL database as well, right? Big table, right? Big DB, right? Lot of things. Cloud DB, right? Things like that. Data management. Okay. Cost of it is security is very, very important. Data security. You know, uh, European Union, if you're actually using, using you need uh, GDPR guidelines you need to follow, right? And if you are actually implementing for a healthcare provider in US, you need to follow HIPAA rules, right? So you need to understand uh, who is got right and to which data. Sure. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think we have received my Okay. Thank you for making it interactive. Okay. Um, even though it is annoyingly um, data consumption, right? Dynamic multimodal as pre-usage patterns. Consumption patterns defining is very important. So I'll show you some of the BI rationalization, BI uh, modernization strategies, right? So cloud is an enabler. So optimize performance and cost, unify, curate, and make big data available quickly in usable forms, enable AIML to unblock potential in unstructured dark areas, support emerging use cases at speed with agility, data management strategy, governance and compliance, right? Data governance is a big area, right? There are a lot of data governance tools. You must have heard about Privacera, you must have heard about uh, Alation, you must have heard about uh, Informatica, uh, Accent, right? So, so there are multiple areas within data governance itself, data security, 
is a sub practice of data governance right so data management data cataloging is another thing building a data dictionary and then how do you create an enterprise data catalog okay so excellent integration with open source technology is resulting in faster build and deploy. So reduce the, the TCO by 20 to 30%, increased speed to insights is very, very important from a warehouse modernization perspective because always, always performance is a bottleneck when you're accessing historical data. Whereas performance may not be a bottleneck when you're accessing a transactional data because the number of scans that you have to do in a warehouse, the number of millions of rows that you have to really scan um, before even you execute a query, right? Uh, maybe a direct query from a Power BI report to an Azure Synapse, right? Or SQL DWH. It will go through multiple things, right? And warehouse modeling is completely different from normal relational modeling. So when you are doing data modeling, in a normal relational modeling, it is called ER modeling entity relationship model. So tables, columns, rows, integrity constraints, primary key, foreign key, right? Various integrity constraints, so that is ER modeling, okay? Now we normally create a conceptual data model, then we create a logical data model, then we create a physical data model, and when physical data model will have scripts, and then we'll run those scripts, and that scripts will create your data model. In a dimensional modeling, okay? In a warehouse modeling, it's completely different, right? Star schema or snowflake schema you can use. So it is facts and dimensions, right? So that is the way it is. There is one more data modeling. I'm not going to talk about it, but it is just for your information. It's called uh, vault-based modeling. So it's so-called hubs and satellites, right? In So which data model is applicable You know, in which area? So I think that is also very, very critical, right? Now, a warehouse modernization on AWS, let's take it as an example, right? So if you take the market share, okay, and you're spread across countries, okay, and all of your all of your area, why it is on AWS, right? Warehouse modernization in AWS is, is very critical, right? So some of these future-proof solutions stack across data supply chain, right? If you really look at strong focus on data analytics, and AI and machine learning, right? So Aurora, these are some of the AWS services that can be used, right? And some of the vendor partnerships. So one very, very critical area before you select your, um, your solution, which warehouse you will select, right? Do you select Redshift? Do you select SQL DWH or Synapse? Do you select Snowflake? Or do you select Google BigQuery, right? Or you will use Lakehouse approach of Databricks, right? Which one you will use? Basically, one of the key thing you look at the left hand side are key decision makers. But nowadays, everybody has got all these spread. But you know, the other very, very important thing that you normally look at, uh, how many offerings are coming from independent software vendors? And some of the relationships are given here, right? So largest number of data features available on cloud. So you will use some of these things and you will select, right? And then you will select what to move, where to move, how to move, and how to consume, right? So when you say what to move, you always look at your risk, payload, and workload complexity, define strategy of target uh, architecture, migration, okay? Operationalize the data consumption, everything, right? So our methodology of data warehouse mode uh, on AWS is some, somewhere here. Right now, you see access pattern analysis. So it's very detail oriented, right? So, um, but it's important what to move, where to move, how to move, and how to consume, right? So you have to define all these kind of stuff. So if you look at, you know, in terms of how to consume, refactor the consumption, interactive querying, exploratory analysis, regular reporting, or mix of all. Some people do not want reports, right? Some people just wanted to say, uh, I, I want my applications to consume the data through APIs. So API-based consumption is one consumption model, right? BI consumption is normal reporting consumption model. ML consumption is basically data scientists. They do not want a very structured data. They normally need unstructured data for their models to run multiple times, right? So consumption model and identifying the consumption model is very, very important. Now, 
data transition query conversion etl modernization data reconciliation why this is important here because in any data migration data modernization or warehouse modernization folks etl extract transform load first you extract then you transform it and then you load into the warehouse is the most costliest affair right 70 percentage of 60 to 70 percentage of your estimates or effort consumed by etl that is why you see the trends in the today's industry zero etl okay zero code so zero etl is a very very important thing that is happening there are a lot of engines which can actually scan through your etl and convert them automatically so that you can reduce your etl effort right so we are using something that is called as blade bridge in a snowflake migration a blade bridge analyzer can analyze your etl existing etl pipelines and convert and then it's all automatic right and if you are running your some of your uh, uh, you know say that you know you are running uh, some spark uh, uh, things i am not going to the complexity of technology because once i go into the technology i will be diverted in that direction right so i just wanted to give you a glimpse of you know from a business perspective right um, a data warehouse warehouse optimization operations in data warehouse and discovery of the data warehouse right so basically these things are very very important from a warehouse modernization uh, perspective so if you look at you know some of these things right you know um, um, data landing and deep archive systems separate storage and compute active you these are some of the use cases right that we normally solve in any warehouse modernization system active archive fast bi on data lake right this is something very important how fast my reports can work right my current report slas are so so and so right and when i modernize my warehouse what will be the new slas of my report right a typical architecture warehouse modernization uh, in aws environment is been given here so basically you can see the data ingestion is one thing then you have a teradata uh, kind of stuff right you know and then aws system here and then your data consumption validation uh, very very easily understandable steps i have simplified it for all of you right now normally we, we do a kind of you know a component canvas right you will do a data disk so source data warehouse it can be teradata netisa sql server oracle exadata snowflake or google bigquery when you do a data discovery right then you do a schema conversion data migration data storage schema conversion is something very very important right because you have a source schema what is schema schema is nothing but the grammar okay uh, so if you are using grammar to write an english passage you have to follow certain rules and that is how your passage is being structured the way the data is being structured in a database is adhered by its schema okay so the schema is a grammar so when you are migrating the data into another system what is the new grammatical ecosystem in my target that is very important so schema conversion is very very important data migration data storage service query conversion validation etl transformation security so we'll go a little bit uh, fast here uh, we will do a typical life cycle approach for a data warehouse modernization discovery then we do a schema optimization then we do a query conversion then we do a data validation and then we will do a dwh movement right and again very very structured approach in terms of how we do a warehouse modernization so in point so again we looked at this right you know in terms of warehouse strategy migration and planning is your initial case business case you need you need discovery then you need to work so some of these things automating is very very critical right so um i will show you a modernization roadmap now very quickly right Keep tight okay so a discovery is very important why should i do a discovery data discovery because you need to understand how many databases are there you need to understand the metadata what do you mean by metadata the data about the data right that is metadata right metadata of my database in uh, having definitions in terms of hey how many tables right and how many of them are transaction tables what is my master data 
how many columns in this particular table. It stores the information about the database, that is the metadata, right? So understanding a source ecosystem is always easy if you query the metadata, right? So we have discovery accelerators that we use to query the metadata to understand the data ecosystem, excuse me. Profile the data. Once you understand, then you understand the load, volume, job inclination. Is it a daily load or is it a weekly load? Uh, uh, or is it an incremental load? Or is it uh, uh, live streaming? Normally live streaming will not happen in a warehouse modernization, right? Until unless you want to combine your OLTP systems and OIAP systems. For example, SAP, you take the case, right? SAP, BCC, ECC. SAP, ECC is, uh, is a ERP system. All the ERP systems are OLTP systems. They contain transactional data, right? Now, you go to SAP BW. SAP BW is a warehouse, business warehouse, right? It is OLA. Now, look at this COVID situation, right? Um, how many of you know that crisis management? Crisis management is very critical because when you are having a production floor, uh, take this case of this company which was creating these flowers and perfumes and kind of stuff, right? So they had their uh, raw materials supply from China, okay? And they cannot build their product if the raw materials are not available. So when China shut down and COVID affected China, what to do? It's a global company. Your raw materials are not available. The only way you need to understand is that what is the impact you need to predict, forecast to understand the raw materials. So when it came to me, um, it's like, you know, it is huge. SAP ECC system contains something called bill of materials. A bill of material is a very complicated structure, right? It contains, it contains parent, child, uh, sub-child, and again, recursive structure, right? How do you build a analytical system by taking data from a transactional system and analytical system together and mix them together and flatten it out, okay? And put it in a snowflake and build a crisis management system saying that, okay, prediction, prediction say that, hey, this month, this time, this raw material may not be available, okay? So that level of prediction we had to do to make sure the business is running, right? I, I just gave you an example, right? Um, so discovery is important, understanding your source systems, right? And once you have done the discovery, what is discovery? Object level discovery, metadata level discovery, object classification, right? Again, I'm not going into uh, detail. This is a discovery and I'll show you one sample discovery report. This is a real time discovery report where you have how many DB objects are there? How many tables are there? Partition tables are there? Materialized views at DB size. And you can actually see the complexity, right? Overall object distribution. And then size in GB by database, object distribution across DB by object type, right? So you see all this, right? This is a typical discovery report. Now, once you have done a data discovery, then you need to do a BI discovery, business intelligence discovery. Okay, extract the metadata, understand the usage of dashboards. Dashboarding is a critical part of your BI, right? Then understand the data sets and analysis report, right? So you, again, you go through the same thing. You go through a CRUD framework normally to do, uh, uh, it helps to consolidate, retain, eliminate, develop, enabling rationalization, right? So, so a detailed analysis of the Power BI and Salesforce landscape is under. So this is a real time uh, stuff I took from a client case study, right? So you can see, how an analysis findings from a BI discovery, how it is going to be. Finance and sales in, in how many reports are there? How many views in the last 90 days for each of this report? So you have to go and study this first, right? And then you need to formulate a summary of findings, right? So you are saying that at the enterprise level, 1,200 out of 3,500 reports are used, okay? Time frame being from the start of metadata. Analysis is only one part of these reports are used. Unused reports should be decommissioned. Very important. Client, customer doesn't know whether the reports are being used until unless you 
bring an ex expert consultant, right? Like you, right? And you will not be able to understand this. So many a times, folks, this is a challenge that the business or the running entity do not know the underlying complexity of the data. How much data has been accumulated? How much of this data is really worth? How many of this data is really not at all used? How much of this data that you've been spending money like anything? Remember, there are a lot of data lakes created. Okay, but I'm telling you, 80% of data lakes are not being used. Okay, or not being used in a proper way. So as a subject matter expert, as a consultant, it is very important when you're doing modernization, going and telling your customer in terms of advising in all these areas, right? So doing a current state architecture once discovery is done, so you do an ASIS architecture, right? So you will say that I have source layer, I have ingestion layer, data layer, consumption, right? I'll do this. Then you do a use case prioritization, okay? So you need to understand the use case prioritization. So then you say that, okay, 10 use cases captured. Data collection is storage, KPIs, migration process, BI reporting, ETL, all these are use cases that has been captured, right? So you, according to the business teams, 10 stakeholder interviews you do, 10 use cases that you capture. So you do a very big interview process. Target state architecture. So once you have done your initial uh, current state architecture, then you create a target state architecture, right? So basically, your remember your business case, whatever challenges that you said in your business case, I think your target state architecture should mitigate that. So you say a challenges and then consideration. Architectural consideration for each of the uh, challenges that has been uh, mentioned there. For example, lack of governance, right? Implement a proper data governance uh, model, right? That is very, very, very important, right? ETL rationalization, okay? So you do a target state architecture, okay? Define and set up the modern data platform, move on existing workloads to the cloud monitor, right? And this is a typical modern state architecture. I'm just showing you, uh, this will be different. In GCP, it will be different, right? So you build a bronze layer, silver layer, gold layer, right? And then you see that uh, your data ingestion, this is storage and processing, downstream integration, right? And your consumption here, right? So compute, okay? And then you have your data governance, your management and security, and ops and support or horizontals. So this is a typically a modern data architecture that you build as your target state architecture, right? Then you build a conceptual future state architecture, technical view. Then you try to put technology into it. So you remember here, here you have not put any technology. Now you move in Azure. If I am doing it in Azure, right? Oh, this is my Azure data lake, right? And this is my Azure data share. And this is my SQL synapse. So here you are implementing your technology, your product, right? And you say allation is being used for metadata, data lineage, data quality, and data cataloging. So mapping of them into a technology architecture and then a conceptual architecture data flow view. How the data, okay. So you created a modern data architecture without technology components. Then you retrofit your technology components into it on which cloud you are going to implement this. Right? And the typical cloud service, you put it into each of those box. Now, what you mentioned is that how my data is flowing through these layers, right? The data flow. Normally, this is your target state architecture. In a BI architecture, okay? So you do a BI, normally you do a BI rationalized an analysis. Then you do a detailed analysis and findings, your CRUD framework, rationalization recommendations, migration metrics, a TCO analysis, a migration roadmap. So this is the second industry trend, folks, warehouse modernization, right? Now, let us quickly look at a data on cloud evaluation. How do you understand which cloud you need to use, right? So you, you look at you know some of the parameters. I'll just quickly go through, uh, OK? Yeah, so look at your um, 
this is important, right? Data and cloud platform evaluation, a 3D approach is what we recommend, right? You look at a landscape assessment, use case alignment, evaluation strategy, evaluate the cloud platform, evaluate storage compute patterns, evaluate cloud architecture, high level architecture, detail architecture, roadmap recommendation. Do if the customer comes and ask you, do I have to use Azure? Do I have to use the AWS? Do I have to use GCP? Which one I should use, right? And this is the approach, the 3D approach will help you to do that, okay? So discover diagnostics and deliverables is our 3D approach to identify and suggest which cloud you are going to use. So cloud strategy, cloud evaluation is the third industry trend, which even though you think that it may be legacy, but it is very, very critical in a typical data platform uh, development, right? So data landscape assessment, okay? Then you do a use case alignment, okay? And then you go through diagnostics, strategy and evaluation, okay? Cloud platform evaluations, you will go through geographic presence you because you need to know if you're using AWS, AWS regions, where all it is covered, a zone to zone, okay? Do you have a disaster recovery system where all GCP has got their own data centers? End of the day, even though if it is cloud, they all run on data centers, right? You still need that physical data center. The only thing is that you as a customer do not need to host your data in a data center because the cloud provider is providing you one level of abstraction, right? Volumetric, artificial intelligence, data supply chain, and storage, right? So you do all this and storage and compute evaluation and warehouse evaluation, okay? Lake evaluation, data lake evaluation, and there's an evaluation criteria, very extensive, right? You do all this kind of stuff. And then cloud architecture evaluation, right? You do an architecture evaluation and then deliverables, what, what do we deliver? We, we provide a high level reference architecture, okay? Uh, see, you need a query engine, you need a in-memory analytics, you need a simple uh, schema, right? So all these kind of stuff, right? So we provide all these details and then we provide a roadmap and recommendations, uh, you know, and the 3D approach, you can actually apply a checklist approach to identify which cloud you have to go through, okay? Quickly moving into um, an area called data fabric versus data mesh, where it is very, very, um, important. Uh, what is data fabric? So what is currently happening in the data? Okay. What is the difference between a mesh and a fabric? Again, going back to my initial principles, which I told you, relate to the current happening. Okay. Mesh and fabric, right? A mesh is more decentralized. A fabric is more centralized. A data lake is part of a data fabric, right? In an organization, a data fabric democratizes the data access across enterprise. See, remember, five years back or 10 years back, the problem statement was, I don't have a unified data lake. I want all my organizational data in one place. So people started creating, okay, data lake. Why do people build lakes? to store water from various sources, right? Central uh, data, uh, water lake normally, right? So data lake is nothing but get from all the sources, dump it there. So your problem is solved, right? You have all the data in one place. Now do what? Build a fabric, right? A, da a data fabric, a data lake is part of it. And then you have cloud data stores and then repositories, right? So you use consumption patterns, a data catalog, governance, ingestion, pipelining, orchestration. So what is currently happening is data lake, sorry, data fabric. It is centralized in one place. Now, now comes the question, hey, what happens? In my organization, I have a lot of line of business, okay? In a pharma industry, or if you take the case of a healthcare industry, or if you take the case of a banking industry, BFSI, right? You have loans, you have FX, uh, you know, uh, then you have reconciliation, uh, you know, 
then you have multiple things. You have payments, right? Um, there are a lot of things, right? Now, who can access which piece of data? You are saying that, okay, you have centralized all the data and now everybody can access it from there. But I am saying that is not right because my organization is complex. My organization is having multiple uh, domains, LOBs, line of business. So that is where mesh comes into picture, right? So what is a fabric? So I have explained it in a very simple way. Uh, a conceptual architecture of a data fabric is here. Okay. So this is a normally what we are doing. We build a data lake and then we build a data warehouse and then we take the necessary data from the lake and we ingest the data from the sources to the lake and then take the data curated. So there is a bronze, silver, gold. Okay. Now we curate, nourish the data when it comes to the gold and ready for consumption, right? Out of that, we take historical data, move it into a warehouse so that, you know, the BI consumption can happen. And your gold data lake can be used for your ML consumption, AML consumption, right? So fabric and anal analytic operations. So I will take it in a very, very simple thing, a data fabric or mesh architecture, right? In a data mesh implementation, you need to be very clear with your do business domains. Because in a data mesh architecture, every line of business is going to have a data lake. So it is not decentralized, it is not centralized. It is decentralized, right? So it, it, is, it is like, you know, okay, uh, you think about India before this Panjayati Raj came, right? Right? So what you can see is that before it was a lot of power that has been there with only one single entity. Right? Now, when you decentralize things, you are actually giving the power and empowering it to the bottommost entity, right? So that is mesh. Uh, yeah. So fabric versus mesh, there is a comparison. Okay. So what kind of organizations mesh is used? Mesh is not, mesh is not um, recommended for small organizations. Mesh is recommended for organizations with large data complexity, sharing issues, multiple line of business, okay, and thousands and thousands of users across multiple line of business and who can access which piece of data, right? That is about a fabric versus mesh. This is another trend, okay? Do you need to build a fabric? So we, just going back, we thought, we discussed about data, modernization, we discussed about warehouse modernization, we discussed about the cloud uh, strategy, right, which cloud 3D approaches, and now data fabric versus data mesh, right? So 360 degree cu customer view. You must have heard about customer 360, right? Customer 360, product 360, these are all use cases, right? The 360 degree view of uh, uh, customers, products, Supply chain 360, right? These are all use cases. Now, some of the data fabric vendors, Renodo, Talent, Informatica, they're all data fabric vendors. Data fabric pattern in Snowflake, I'm not going into this uh, detailed one, right? Um, so we'll just quickly jump into, um, uh, okay, I'll take 10 minutes and 15 minutes for you to ask questions, right? So. In terms of AI area, right? Artificial intelligence, what is happening? And that is my last topic today. Uh, so data as a service and data enhanced products, data insights, right? So data science and AI, okay? So our expertise in data and AI, right? Quickly let me just, okay. Introduction to data science and AI. So, AI is embarking on the next wave of disruption like never before. Generative AI, all of you heard about generative AI, right? So what is generative AI? It can generate content. If I, in any testing cases, testing scenarios, if you need to build testing for an application, you need to build test data. If you can build a test data, normally you need to get uh, your TDM, test data management systems, and collate the data for your test data. Refresh from your production to your non-production for testing, 
right, to your QA engine. Here you are going and asking a question to generate the data, right? Open AI, right? Everybody has heard about open AI, the disruption it is creating. Build AI to build with AI, okay? AI trism, AI democratization, verticalized AI products and platforms, domain specific AI, right? Telecom in 5G, right? The AI. Previously, AI was a very really generic, generic topic, right? Now it is not like that, right? Demystify the AI, right? Know what to develop, fine tune, interference, execute, and scale, right? So, mind, science, and engineering, okay? is our strategies AI innovation cycle, okay? So demystifying the AI is basically, you know, you have data pivoted AI. So without data, you cannot build a model, right? Without model, you cannot apply your data science use cases uh, on that, right? So data is a primary and permanent asset for architecting enterprise resilience. So this is where one thing very, very important coming is data quality. If you don't have the right quality of the data, your AI model on top of the data is not going to work. However robust is your algorithm and whatever uh, comprehensive is your algorithm, right? If you don't have the right data, that is very difficult. Model pivoted data, right? So that means tends to treat data as a static asset and the development of models as the main driver of business outcomes. So here data as a main asset, then model, then application pivoted AI. Application is the foundation around which data model is created. Then human pivoted AI, right? Uh, vision systems, right? Identifying facial recognition of people. You must have seen during the COVID time, thermal imaging, right? In airports, right? It can actually measure the temperature when you're actually going, right? So, so human in the loop, in front of, in front and the center of AI solutions. So our capabilities within data and AI is uh, here, data discovery, insights, pattern mining, anomalies and outlier de detections, natural language understanding, knowledge graphs, right? Uh, especially knowledge graphs are very, very critical in life science areas, pharma industries, right? Where you use, uh, either you use um, uh, uh, Neo4j, right? Or AWS Neptune, right? some of these things, right? So if you look at Azure Cosmos DB, they can actually store graph databases inside, right? It can also act as a graph DB, right? So forecasting and graph DB, when you actually using there, uh, what you're actually writing is, is not SQL, right? So it is, it's a different query language that you will uh, use in a graph database. Forecasting as optimizations, right? Regression, classification, natural language processing, graph ML, embedded AI, contact center AI, conversational AI, document AI, auto annotation platform, AI readiness, demystifying AI, AI trism, okay, reinforcement learning with human feedback, right? This is healing machines, right? See, in a production support system, say that 30% of my production incidents can be resolved by my AI healing engine, right? So your productivity will improve. So Due to human intervention, every time when somebody goes and solves a problem, incident in production, the AI healing system learns how the person is solving the issue, okay? And the next time it, it will go and solve the problem, right, by its own. An example is that say that there's a P1 incident that is coming every time. And in fact, this is something that we have implemented, right, very successfully. Uh, uh, I did this for, uh, uh, Disney, right? So a P1 incident is coming, right? Disney's theme parks are down, right? If you need to do, there is a bad job that need to be, there is a bad job failure. It's a very common thing. So what a human production support person will do, go and kick off uh, the bad job. So the healing system understands this. Hey, every time when this incident is coming, this guy is going and picking up this bad job, okay? Learned. Next time when it comes, it understood the pattern, it will go and pick up the bad job by itself. Problem solved, productivity improved. I'm just taking a small, simple example, right? Then 
AI readiness assessment framework. We have a readiness assessment framework where we score maturity, AI maturity, um, and then overall maturity can be put it into five different dimensions, strategy, governance, data quality, uh, LLM ops, right? Large language models. You are aware of this now. This is especially after the Gen, Gen AI, right? Adoption. Domain focus, experimentation hub, right? Stepped up horizontal focus, consulting strategy and capabilities, data quality, data governance focus, right? Very, very critical. Healthcare, license, banking, finance, commercials, these are the common areas where the AI engine is been very, um, very, especially we see a lot of uh, traction. If you look at, you know, uh, some of the use cases you can actually look at, right? In a healthcare, auto passing of medical documents like physician notes and discharge summaries. For example, you know, previously there used to be a medical transcription kind of stuff. It's like in a, a doctor in the US uh, use a dictaphone and examining or doing the surgery, operational procedure explains this. And this comes as a voice file to India. And the medical transcription companies, what they used to do is that they translate this. A tran transcriber will sit here and then transcribe it in English. And the next day morning, it is going back to US, right? Now, this system is completely disrupted now. Because there is a natural language system, it can automatically hear, listen, and an AI engine can tra transcribe by itself, right? Enable smart ICD mapping using NLP, predictive analytics, AI in mental health, knowledge graphs and LLMs in constructing cages, right? For biomedical documents, I'm going to read out all these kind of stuff, but I think most of you are familiar with all this. LLMs are coming right everywhere, large language models, right? So a typical AI life cycle, discovery and strategy, data understanding, right? Insights, model development, then model deployment, model management, model governance, and value realization. You look at here, Discovery and strategy and value realization and data understanding is therefore, whether it is for data engineering projects or whether it is data science projects, they are common. But if you look at insights, model development and model de deployment and model management and model governance are different, right? Most complex areas are LLM estimation. How do I estimate for a large language model, right? Data prep for LLM embedder, embedder models Gen A maturity index determiner, efficient fine tuning accelerator, data quality for LLMs. So very, very important. These are some of the challenging areas, um, you know, which need to be applied in each of this area, right? So you look at the stars, where all they are implemented. Okay. I'm not getting into the math squared. You know, I think everybody knows that it is um, very, very critical uh, thing. Uh, paradigm shift from siloed models to uh, interdisciplinary collaboration focused on value, right? So speed plus value realization is something very, very important, right? <clears throat> Typical challenges in an AI programs, absence of established frameworks to define value and ROI. Somebody asked me, I implement this prediction model, right? Or I implement this recommender model, right? What is ROI? Very difficult to calculate. Very difficult to tell up to front, right? Because the underlying complexity of the data, quality of the data uh, decides the efficiency of my model that I am developing. Diversity of skills, ambiguity of process, extent of collaboration and change management, right? Outcomes, higher confidence index, create strategic values, fail fast, rapid time to production. Who are involved, right? Product owner, data scientist, data analyst, ML engineer, testing analyst. By the way, very, very important, these three roles. People normally get confused between a data scientist and ML engineer. An ML engineer, data engineer is very, very critical for a data scientist to be successful. Okay. I will pause there for a moment. And I have some case studies, but I will not go to the case studies. Um, I would like to um, take some questions.
floor open to questions. We have 13 minutes. Um, and the moderator, please um, enable people so that they can ask questions. I hope, folks, this was good for you. Some of the trends in the uh, data area. These are some of the real life examples which I have showed you. Sure, so can we go for question answers? Hari, can we go for question and answer? Yes. Okay. Uh, Batch, can you please uh, raise your hand if you have any questions? Rohan, you may unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I'll go ahead. All right. So first of all, thank you. I think uh, that was an extremely loaded session, you know, going from data warehousing, cloud trends, a lot to kind of absorb. So thanks for that. And uh, now I'll shoot my question. So that's uh, like as a technology leader, um, you know, I see that you have this immense experience in designing solution architectures and uh, product architectures with respect to client needs. So what strategies have you been, you know, kind of using in driving sales enablement to deliver these uh, custom technology solutions for your clients? Good question, Rohan. So first of all, um, as a solutioning person, um, you cannot just go with empty hands, right? Because you should see in a, any conversation when you're starting, especially on cloud and data, it's very important to understand the business of your customer. So it is important, even though you are a technologist, you are a solution architect, the right exposure to the business problems and the client's business, and who all are the real customers of your client, right? So that is very important. The second- Sorry. Uh, Sir, I think uh, Mitu is not on mute. Uh, we just have yeah. You were saying yes, second. The second important thing is that your ability in terms of running workshops, like, you know, how to apply design thinking and co create the value, right? So if you have a problem, it's not like, you know, you provide the solution. It is you, you get your customers on the same table so that you're all working together and you are solving the problem. Okay. At least you reach to a MVP stage a minimum viable product stage, it is very important to have your customers along with you so that, it, again, I'm saying data is different from applications. It is very easy to understand an application. You can go through the application. You can log into the application. You can go through some screens related. But complexity of the underlying data and equating that to the business problems is not that simple. Only an extensive discovery can do it. So the breadth of knowledge for a solutioning person is very important, especially at a solutioning stage than the depth. Okay. And you should be able to, you should be able to suggest between, hey, which services is better for you, right? So basically to build the curiosity so that you will get your perceptions managed in the initial conversations. Okay. Otherwise, it is very easy for your clients, customers to form perceptions about you that, hey, you are not my right person. Since you are, use the term sales, I am telling you this. Okay. Third is definitely aware, be aware of the cost, right? And the business case, which I told you, what is defined in the business case? A thorough study of the business case and what is a problem statement and what is the real value realization for the client has to be known upfront, whatever solutions that you are building. To me, these three things are very, very important. Thank you, sir, for answering you know, that question in detail. 
just uh, like as a follow up what what sort of teams do you kind of you know uh, use to uh, create that tangible solution for your customer because as far as i understand uh, there are quite a few analysis that you shared with us during the you know the breadth of the presentation so like the what team, is the sort of team structure that you will use to you know create those solutions and stuff because it looks like a no lot of work for first, one person yes. yeah there is no hard and fast rule for the teams it's all based on your business problems and it's all based on your solutions that you develop right so you may need a team with the business analyst you may need a team with the data engineer you may need uh, two data scientists you need to need two bi people you need a product owner you need a scrum master uh, you know kind of a because normally when you apply agile principles you have sprint cycles right so you have normally everybody wants two weeks to three weeks of sprint cycles so your team has to be team should be able to deliver uh, produce the outcome in every two weeks or three weeks so you need to have a team cast based on what you need to get as an outcome in this two weeks or three weeks of sprint cycles thanks i Roger. think there was like, another oh i think there, <laughs> i think there was another question somebody else raise their hand i think atul is the next person in line so. sure Should I go ahead? Yes, Atul, yeah. please can you unmute yourself and ask your yeah, question? Sorry, sir. Uh, it was a very detailed session, and I think a lot of data for us to look after the session is over. I have one question. Uh, India is currently having 4.5% of world's AI professional, and uh, most of 76% of the data is hired by the IT industry. And traditionally, traditional industry don't do much hiring of the AI professional and the conversion and uh, uh, exposure to AI opportunities on those sectors are low because I'm coming from automotive sector. And uh, so uh, as a result, direct hire of AI is also low in our sectors. There are less number of professionals in our industry. How we are, because straight, unless those traditional companies are changing, how we'll overcome this kind of problem because we are having low uh, number of people as well as, and low number of hiring also literally have hiring in this. Yeah. yeah, I think this is a talent um, acquisition and talent management is a bigger problem that we are um, facing. I can tell you how we are solving this problem, right? Uh, because different organizations solve this problem in a different way. Yes. To me, always building internal talent and creating an engine internally within the organization is more effective than hiring the talent from outside. Okay. Uh, so, having said that, what we do is that basically we have data engineers, a lot of data engineers we are able to hire, right? And to me, remember, a good ML engineer, okay, should have a good exposure to data engineering. Even though they are not able to do data engineering, they should understand what is data engineering. So, until unless they don't know what a data engineer is doing, and how, how do they know that they will get the data in this particular form? So what we do is that we create um, engines, right? Uh, AML development programs, okay, for data engineers so that their career can be shifted from data engineering to AI engineering is one way of we address this issue, right? Because you can hire data engineers in abundance and then yes. you can look at your existing data engineers and you can cross train them and they can move them to the value chain up to ML engineering. Okay. okay. The second thing is that it's very, very strong partnership with your partner ecosystems, right? Microsoft, we have a very strong partner ecosystem with Microsoft, AWS, and GCP and Google, right? So what we do is that in, say, for example, in GCP, in BigQuery, you have Cloud ML, right? So somebody who knows Cloud GBQ, uh, can actually pick up cloud ML, you know, very fast ecosystem, right? Even though they get a very structured training in terms of this, right? So what we do is that we depends upon Google's of the world, uh, Microsoft of the world, okay? And we have partnership programs like we have architect development programs, we have data science development programs with our partners, and we conduct boot camps, right? Okay. It's not normal training programs. We conduct boot camps. That means they have to real implementation of these. ML systems 
in the say in Azure ecosystem using Azure ML or GCP ecosystem using uh, BigQuery ML, right? And then, mm -hmm. then they come through that process and then they come out, right? So it's a strong partner involvement in terms of building the talent than you go with your normal training and academy. Okay. Okay. So these are the two things that we are very effectively using. So the partnership bring the latest systems in your talent also at the same time you are growing in in house transferring people from ml engineer to the ai engineer giving absolutely them. and then the Thank other you. thing is other thing is that the third thing is multi cloud right in today's world it is very important that previously people used to work you know i am in aws environment i am in gcp environment i am in this environment right but it's very very important to have that multi cloud so that you can mix and match your folks across cloud. It's not easy as I'm saying, right? It is not easy. Uh, but if you really put all these all these services, and if you draw, if you look at my modern data architecture diagram, if you draw a box and say that, oh, hey, these are my, um, these are my uh, data, no SQL engines in Azure, no SQL engines in GCP, no SQL engines in AWS, right? See, end of the day, the no SQL engine is same. The implementation is different than Azure service is doing it, right? So to me, to be a multi-cloud, become a multi-cloud ML person, right? Uh, uh, see, rather than you just do use SageMaker, right? Or so rather than you just use TensorFlow, right? Become multi-cloud, yeah. understand, yeah. right? So that is another, these are the three things according to me, very, very important. Thank you, sir. Uh, sure. We are actually working with one partner for IoT enabled devices. They are transferring our data to the cloud and uh, we want to develop an in-house system at that point of time. So, but it was expensive being considered a small company, but thank you for your opportunity. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Atul. Uh, Reshma, can you please go ahead with your question? Yeah. Hi, sir. Can you share Hello? an example? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Sir, can you, can you share an example of a critical IT transformation project you have led in the past? How did you approach the project? What challenges did you face? And what were the key outcomes or successes achieved? You have four questions, Deshma. Okay. You have four questions in one question. Yes, sir. Okay. That is a nice way of doing it, right? Uh, maybe the answer is also there the way in which you ask the question. Um, it's a long thing right you need to understand understanding the sources very specifically i have a hard stop uh, six o'clock i have a client meeting but i'll spend uh, two minutes if you just give me a minute i'll just pass a message and say that i will join five minutes All right. Um, so I'm I'm spending five minutes of my dollars for your question. Okay. Um, so what is happening here is that it, take the case of a, a large. Um, what is it called? A QSR, quick service restaurants, right? Um, so we have we are actually providing one of the largest. I mean, in fact, you know, pioneer in terms of. QSR is one area. We do a lot of QSR thing. Um, so we have globally, we have centralized the entire data platform for uh, QSR, right? For example, you know KFC, right? KFC is our client, right? Across globe. So we did implement it for KFC US and then we did implement it for KFC UK. We did implement for KFC Eastern Europe and we are building it, right? On large integration platforms, right? And then... Um, uh, we have productionized all this stuff. So in any of this thing, multi-region, multi-centered places, it is very important that how do you approach that problem initially to understand the business landscape. Then you build a holistic discovery. Then you make your client understand about their own existing data ecosystem. So remember that I told you about the discovery tools and all kind of stuff. 
you cannot go with your traditional questionnaire approach, asking questions and getting answers. Rather, you should have an automated discovery uh, set, right? So that you can, time is very important here. How fast you can build one MVP. That is what your client is looking at. So we built it in three months time, um, a minimum viable product for them, showed it to them, implemented and then then you normally ingest the data into a data lake. Then you curate the data and put the data from a row zone uh, to a curated zone. Okay, then you build a warehouse out of it, right? And then you have your consumption models you define, and then you build your ML models you define. And the end of it, if you have heard about monetization, right? How do you tell them in terms of how do you monetize this data? So for example, in a typical KFC restaurant, if there is only one sales counter, POS counter, and if there is one, there is a big queue. Because of that wait time, what is actually happening um, because of this data getting propagated is getting delayed. And how much is of revenue they are actually losing out of it, okay? So every movement of data, every time data moving from one to place, you should be able to observe. And that is called data observability, right? And converting that outcomes of your data observability into monetization and telling them that, hey, where all you have contentions, right? And if you remove those contentions with simple mechanisms, right? How to do it? So for example, AI cameras can be kept to understand you know, things in a better way. And you can actually do a lot of stuff so that you, if you go to any of this MACDs or KFCs, you can actually see there are a lot of cameras. Actually, they are not only the security cameras because the data goes, it is streamed and the data goes behind the scenes and it is getting analyzed behind the scenes and there are a lot of uh, reports are getting created out of it. So we have, this is one best example that I can actually take where we have implemented globally, we have implemented the entire data ecosystem for the QSRs, okay? And we have done it for uh, KFCs, we have done it for Pizza Huts, we have done it for the entire EM brands, um, and we are doing it for MACDs, right? Um, thank you, sir. Thank you for answering the question. Sure. Uh, one last question. So, uh, do you want to take a question, or can we go ahead with the vote of thanks? Because I understand you are on a hard stop. Oh, sure. Okay. See, you guys can actually you no. Know, if I if I have, if I have not answered some of your questions, send it to me offline. Okay. Um, okay. So. Yes, um, yeah. Okay, Aman, can you please take over from here? Yeah. Thanks, Neetu. I think that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, sir. On behalf of the Accelerate PGDM GM batch, I would like to express a heartfelt gratitude to you for your enlightening and insightful session. We are really grateful for the time you dedicated for addressing our batch and sharing your knowledge on right from the industry trends in data to the changing dynamics of cloud platforms and the necessary infrastructure and how AI is now an indispensable part of this equation. So we truly appreciate the extensive depths you covered about the relevant topics in this week especially with regards to the importance you placed on understanding business case well, and then relating the business and jargons to real life. Once again, we extend our deepest gratitude for your enlightening session. Your presence in depth discussion would definitely have left an indelible impact on those passionate about this exciting field. And we're truly grateful for the opportunity to learn, learn from your expertise. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hopefully you guys I've got some awareness and then I'm sure that you must have made some notes and then all the very best for you. And thank you all. I really enjoyed it. Bye. Thank you. Thank sir. you so